All right, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. We're getting near the end. I always get sad when we get near the end of things because it's just, it's so fun just to look at truth and to, to see what's going on. And and so uh, I, I think sometimes we can so uh, break down a message that we lose kind of the, the um, big umbrella of it. And uh, so I kind of want to put us in perspective because we look at a passage today when we're in, we're in Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 through 12 and you would think well he's shifting gears and he's talking about praying uh, but I'm, but I think it's important to understand he already talked about prayer he is talking about praying but it's a specific way and I, I want us to do that otherwise listen it's so easy to preach this ask seek and knock right you already know the drill don't you right uh, and go well <laughs> we should just pray more for stuff this passage isn't about praying for stuff. This passage is about praying for wisdom to help those who are dealing with stuff, right? So I want, I want you to hear this because it's different. We're not just talking about prayer. This is why it's important that that we understand a theological term, I don't mean a lot, hermeneutics, that we understand how to pull out of a text exactly the intent of the writer. Listen, it's the easiest thing in the world is grab this prayer Talk, I mean, grab this passage and talk about prayer. You know, ask and be given to you, seek and you should find, knock and be open to you. Woo, let's pray, right? You guys be bold, right? I mean, ask God for big stuff. And we, and there is a message like that. This text is not that. And so it's important that we, I'm not saying you can't pull that application out of it because the scriptures are so deep, you know, right? We can never mine the depths of it. But within his context, he's telling you and me, that this has to do with what we just looked at last week on the issue of judging. So let me kind of bring you to that place, and then we'll just open up the text, and it's pretty self-explanatory, so it should go easy. Um, and so uh, he starts out um, telling us about how we ought to think about ourselves, right? How we ought to see ourselves. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted, right? And he begins to list these things out for us. He's letting us know in great contrast on that hillside that the Pharisees who thought they had it all together, they're really not the blessed ones. Though the rule keepers, the religious folk, they're not the blessed ones because it's not some outward thing. that They wore their religion outwardly. It's what happens on the inside of us. And that's good news for those of us that, that are raw and real in that sense. He's saying, listen, you should be beatitude. Quit being proud and arrogant. Quit being haughty and, and gleeful. Understand there's a time when you should be mourning uh, and sorrow over your own sins and quit glossing it over and with little phrases like, well, that's just how I'm made or, you know, what? No, no. Mourn over those things. And instead of hungering after the things of the world, comfort and power and, and, and you know, uh, wealth and all of those things, why don't you hunger and thirst after righteousness, real righteousness? And so you, you remember the context there. And then so he takes about how we should think about ourselves, and then he gets to verse 13 in chapter 5, and he talks about how we ought to relate to the world. Hey, listen, you're supposed to be salt and light out here. Quit trying to be like them. You, you are salt. You're the ones that's going to enhance the flavor of what's going on in their life. You're the one that's going to, going to keep them and purify them from sin by your lifestyle. Be the light of the world. If you don't live it, it's not about what you say. It's about how you live, right? This is what you, you remember these, this, this old series that we're looking at? And then in chapter 5, he talks about how we relate to the word. And, and he, he went through that. And then he talked about how we relate to practicing the word of God. You've heard that it was said this, but I say to you this, right? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he begins to talk to us about how we relate to money. Hey, quit worrying about money. God has you covered in that area. He's the one who gives you the power to have wealth. He's the one who puts you in places to do that. And if he, if he desires to keep you in poverty, be content there. That's what Paul said, right? When, when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that's another verse we love to rip out of context and go, I can win this race, I can have this football game. No, you know what Paul's saying there? I, 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 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I don't need a thing. If I'm starving, if I'm being beaten, I'm well satisfied. That's the context in which he says that. If we go and study that passage. And so it's important that we know these things. And that's what Jesus is saying here about money. 
Why are you worrying about that? I've got you covered here. Man, you spend way too much time on that. And then he came to this passage in chapter 7. I realize I fast-tracked really fast, but he comes to chapter 7. How do we relate to others? How do we relate to others? And in this sense, it's probably brothers and sisters. Uh, it could be the world. I think it's shrunk down to, to, to family, but that's, a, that's just, you, you, I can't really prove that to you. I just think that that's where, he, that's where the strength of it is. And he says this, and your Bible may have a title there that says, uh, you know, ju uh, judging others or whatever. But really, I think what he's saying is, it's kind of a negative. Stop criticizing people, right? It, we, we talk about, it's not judging. There is judgment because he's he, otherwise, how do we know who the hogs and the dogs are, right? Which he talks about later on. So there's a judging that takes place. But he's saying, hey, listen, in that, there's, there's a humility that ought to happen. And so we looked at that last week. I won't, I won't belabor the point there. But, but in that context, he's telling me, just, hey, stop being critical. You aren't God, and, and you don't know their motive behind what they do, which we just heard in our, in our share time, didn't we? Right? And, and Ms. Legenia said it really well, and, 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 and so, so, uh, you know, so did others. And, and so it's important that, that we see that. Listen, I don't, I don't know why. People have fallen off the rails. And so instead of just going, well, you should have just, they should have done. I spent half my life, that kind of guy. I'm ashamed to tell you that in so many ways. I was an arrogant son of a gun in my younger days. I know some of you thinking, well, he ain't much different today. But, <laughs> but I promise you, if you'd have known me back then, I would make arrogant statements like, if you'll give me five minutes with you, I can tell you three things you ought to do can change your life. Literally, those words would come out of my mouth. Now, I may or may not have been right about a lot of that, but what a what a terrible person that, I'm trying to watch my life, what a terrible person that, I, mean, I wouldn't have got to say a bad word, but you know what I'm saying, what a terrible person that that is who thinks that arrogantly, because I don't know you that well, and a five-minute conversation isn't going to let me do that, and I think, man, and th but this is what he's talking about, so we're clear. You and me size up people, don't we? You walk in a room, you can size them up. Yep, don't like them. Not going to go spend time with them. I don't like them already. Yep, they look like they'd be fun, right? And, and, and we do those things. And then somebody does something wrong, and we're thinking, we just kind of cross our hands and kind of click our tongue together, don't we? Like, mm. Right? That's that arrogance. He's saying stop it. Stop criticizing people for where they are in this time in their life. It's powerful. I might re-preach that whole message again. It was good for me. Uh, and he says, you know why? Because the standard that you're using, yeah, it's going to come back at you. And so you need to be careful here. And then he says, I want you to choose humility, right? Listen, look at the speck in your own eye, right? Hey, have a little humility and realize you got your own screw ups before you start trying to fix people. So he's not saying we shouldn't try to help people. He's saying, hey, before you do that arrogantly so, why don't you just Turn those eyes inside for a minute and just take a gander at your own heart and your own life. And maybe listen to your spouse's voice who's been telling you things that you don't want to hear, right? Or your friends and just start thinking, right? This is, this is the context that what we're getting ready to look at is in. And then he says, you, look, you, you can't help others who don't want help. That's why he's saying, hey, listen, so there's going to come a time you don't give what's holy to dogs, right? You want to help people and maybe you've even checked yourself and said, okay, my life's pretty clean, right? And so now we're in the passage in Galatians. When you see your brother trapped in sin, you who are spiritual, what is it? Spiritual people doesn't mean they know more of the Bible. Spiritual people means they have a humble heart. That's how God judges us. And so spiritual people are those who are, who are mature enough to be humble and know that if God isn't helping and God isn't at work in them, they, they're nothing. Right? And so there's there's this. And he says, then you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Not harshness, not slapping him around, berating him and all of that. Uh, but but in a spirit of gentleness. Looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Hey, don't think that you're not going to fall again either. Just because you're good right now doesn't mean you might not stumble too. So let's, let's be gentle with others, right? And so this is the message that he gave us last week and we looked at that. And and so so he's so he we do judge people, but we judge from a spirit of humility and from what the word says. The world wants to take this and use this to beat us with and put the Christians in the corner and say, shut up. Even your own Jesus told you not to judge others. So don't judge me about how I want to live my life. 
And if you're not a believer, you got bigger issues than me judging you, so I'm not. I'm, I'm with you. But if you claim to be a believer, well, then I have a responsibility to, to, to help bring you where you ought to be. Galatians says that. But there's a, there's a way in which I ought to come first. And so before I decide to judge my brother and sister in Christ, one, I ought to realize I don't know their motives, so I can't judge that. I, 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 and I should, and I should uh, be humble about it. Well, then he comes into this, and he says, you know what else you ought to do? You ought to pray and ask wisdom before you do that. It's the same context. He didn't shift gears. It's not like all of a sudden Jesus made this hard left turn. Let's talk about judging others. Now let's talk about pray, praying to God. No, no, no. He's saying, let's talk about judging people. And let's talk about how you don't know their motive and you don't understand all of those things, but you do bear responsibility to help them because they're your brother and sister in Christ. And he's going to give us an illustration at the end and you know it, right? It's the golden rule. Hey, so do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's where we're going today. But he gave us two things. Don't criticize. Pray for wisdom. We're putting this in the context. That makes sense to you? I want you to see it. I'm not trying to steer you in a way to, to, to pervert something here. I just want you to understand what he's saying. Uh, and so he's saying, hey, this is, this is what you ought to do. Because people are complicated, aren't they? We just talked about that. Right, Miss Virginia? You, you had a hard time trying to figure out why your kids would be the way they were. And you're praying for them. And then God goes, hey, let me give you a little illustration, Miss Virginia. Yeah, I, I, what about that coffee thing, right? I mean, that's a silly thing. I mean, in one sense, but, but not what he was trying to do with you, right? And so that's what happens. And so when we look at ask, seek, and knock, the whole point of this is, this is a prayer we pray for those people who find, them, who find themselves in trouble and they're believing brothers and sisters and we want to help them. Before we shoot our mouth off, let's slow down, get some humility, Check our own sin. Make sure we're right with the Lord. And then let's just call upon his name. Are we ready? Let's just look at it because it's easy. I told you it's an easy sermon. I just needed to set all this up. And you guys actually set it up for me. That was powerful. Um, so chapter, um, chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it, it will be opened. Now, I'm going to bring this back to reality because a lot of people will take this out of context, right? And just say, hey, just ask, seek, and knock. You get everything you want. Well, there, there are some parameters about this prayer. God didn't just hand you, you know, your American Express black, you know, card and go, hey, just, just go have at it right? There, there, there are parameters around this thing. You don't just have carte blanche to get whatever you want to. I know that because I just want to run through some scriptures with you real quick to kind of temper that thought. And, and listen, we all should pray large prayers. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying that God doesn't answer our prayers. But, but sometimes this thing trips us up because we just think, well, if I just ask, seek, and knock, I'm going to get something answered. And when we don't, people's faiths are shipwrecked because they're like, well, God, God's a liar. No, you misunderstood the text. And you misunderstood some truths that balance that out. And so let me just give you one. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 says this, And whatever you ask, we receive from him. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. See, see we ask... And, and if we're keeping his commandments, that's the same thing when he says, hey, why don't you take care of that speck first, or that log first, before you start getting the speck, right? So my prayer, God's not, he's not obligated to just answer all my prayers. I mean, he does answer them. Sometimes no. Lots of times no, right? Uh, but but, but what's, what's the deal saying? We should ask, right? And you ought to ask, because that's the only place wisdom is going to come from. It's a dependency on God. If God is going to use me to help my sister in Christ who's struggling with something, I'm, I have to depend on his wisdom, not mine, because my wisdom is arrogant. My wisdom is like, just talk to me, and I'll tell you three ways, change it, right? That's the kind of stuff don't do. It's like, hey, let's, 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 let's depend on God. But what does he say? Ask whatever you will, right? Because we keep his commandments and do the things who please him. And listen to this, 
in James chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you don't receive because you're asking with wrong motives so that you may spend what you request on your own pleasures. Listen, God's not just going to going to uh, you know support your selfish habit he's not some drug dealer who's just going to keep giving you a drug of choice so you can maintain that addiction right and that's the whole point of what he's saying you got wrong motives here and then back to john he says this this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us the world hates to add that little phrase if if it, if the lord wills Right, those health and wealth people want you just to demand things from God. He's your magic genie. Just demand it. You don't have to. You don't. You you decide His will. Well, I don't know what school you went to or where you what happened, but that that ain't the way it works in my world. I, God's never asked me my opinion about things. He's told me His, and whenever He's asking me an opinion, it's a test, right? Like like Job. Hey Job, do you know? Right, whenever God starts talking to you like that. No, he, he doesn't, he's not asking you to give him the answer because he doesn't know. He's asking you to give him the answers because you need to know who's in charge, right? And so, so just, I want to give you that. Now, let's just look at these three, three things, ask, seek, and knock, right? So if we put in perspective, then this is pretty easy. Ask God means I should, listen, if I'm going to help my friend, my friend needs God to speak through me. He doesn't need my, my stuff, right? I got all kind of wisdom. Some of it's earthly, some of it's uh, heavenly, and some of it's an odd mixture that is perverted. What I need to know is, God, what do you want me to say to my friend? So there's a dependence. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. It doesn't always come easy, does it? Sometimes the Lord's like, you know, I'm not shouting at you. You say you want to know. Do you? And so he makes us start seeking because what does that do? It, it tells me whether or not I really want the answer or I don't. There's something about seeking that means I'm determined to find something, right? And so there's something good about that. And so that's that diligence. So ask is that dependence. Seeking is diligence. Listen, man, there was a time in my life that one of my family members was going through some tough stuff. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago. And that's when I started walking the streets of Birmingham. And I remember telling the Lord, I'm coming every day. I'm going to keep asking you for wisdom. I'm going to keep asking you to fix this thing. I'm going to keep asking you to do it. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to quit walking until you do. Right? That, there's something about that. It took, a, it took a long time before the Lord answered. And I, and I wish I could tell you some of those things, but it's not my story to tell. But I remember walking one day. I mean, it felt like, all right. I mean, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Are you tired of listening to me? Because I'm tired of saying it. But I don't know how to quit. And the Lord was, I just, I just heard a few little words. It's done. And I'm like, you know, then you're doubting yourself. Okay, is that because you want to hear that part of or is that really God, right? And so I'm like, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, are y'all, you're like that too, right? I mean, you don't all of a sudden go, oh yeah, God, that's God. Um, I don't know. I know how to act like God sometimes in my own head, right? I make God say things in my own head, but I want to hear his voice. And I thought, well, I'm not sure. But it felt like it. And the more I prayed, that's all I heard. I didn't hear anything else in my mind. And when I say heard, I mean it's a thought that just keeps coming. Right. It just wouldn't go away. You know, it's not like I heard anything. It's just there it is. Man, in the middle of that night, my family member called, and it was done. And I thought, wow, right? But but that's that whole diligence. Right? There comes a time when you got to love your friends long enough that you're going to ask and you're going to seek and you're going to knock. Even they don't care if you're doing it. But you're going to do it because it's the loving thing to do. Right? And so we're going to be, we're going we're gonna, to, they, we're going to let them borrow our faith. We're going to let them borrow our prayers. This is the force of this text. And then that knocking is a lot like the diligence. It's just, it's just more of it. It's determination. Right? That's what he says, right? Um, ask. Oh, where, how, what happened to it? Where'd he go? Uh, yeah, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. Right? Wisdom. And the one who seeks, finds. What? What? That wisdom. And the one who knocks, what? God's going to open up 
the storehouse of heaven and give you wisdom so that you can meet those needs because he's the God who provides for us, right? And my God shall meet all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. This is well. And so then he gives us this illustration. Um, and he says, uh, or what person is, oh, no, um, for everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks will be open. Or what person is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone, right? Is God, is God, is God going to do that for you? That's just weird that he would just trick you like that. God's not doing that. And then he gives the other illustration. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a, a snake, will he? Now, that's an interesting phrase, because the, the word fish there, that's a, and real quickly, I'm going to be done with this, but, but, but these are contrasting that which was lawful and that which was unlawful. They would have heard it this way, because they knew you didn't go around eating uh, eels or snakes or, or whatever, because it was, it, was like, it was like a pig. You couldn't eat it. But you could eat fish. And so what, I want you to hear what we're saying we take away from this. He's not a father isn't, doesn't deceive his kid and go, oh, you want some bread? Here. Right now, in those days, and where that was, it's some limestone that was up against the rivers in the Jordan, and it looked a lot like the bread cakes that they would have, the unleavened kind. And so, it literally, you could put them side by side and go, kind of looks like they're bread. I know we're thinking, you were sometimes thinking like a field stone, but it was different than that. So, God's not into deception. If you if you're asking, seeking, and knocking, and you hear God answer, He's not going to deceive you, nor is He going to tell you to do something illegal, unlawful, unholy. And so when you when you hear and God answers, ask us those questions. I mean, you need to be certain that, that that's going on. He's not deceiving you, nor is he going to tell you to do something that's unlawful. Why? Because he's a good father. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And then it, now, now it all comes together, right? Because then he says this, in everything, therefore. What's the therefore? We, we, anytime we see a therefore, we stop and ask, what's it there for? What's he talking about? The context of judging. Hey, don't criticize, but, but do love. Well, how do we love? By praying for them and getting wisdom so that we're giving them God's stuff, not my stuff. And so that's where this phrase comes in. In, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Do unto others as you would have them do unto now, the world, the, the world puts that in a negative spin, right? Confucius and so many other of the other, you know, uh, philosophical giants in the world would say, uh, don't do to others what you don't want done to them. That's how Confucius said it. So you hear a lot of people today go, well, Jesus didn't invent that phrase. I'd beg to differ. Your philosophers gave you a negative phrase. Don't do what you don't want done to you. My God gave me a positive phrase. Do to others in the same way you want done to you. It's powerful, isn't it? So we got a lot of friends that are struggling with a lot of things. And this is this is how we do it. How do how would I want to be treated? Then I'm gonna do that. <coughs> I would want somebody praying for me and somebody asking for wisdom to bring me God. I want I may not want to hear God's wisdom when they bring it, but that's at the core, that's what I need. Right? Man, that's the message today. That's good stuff. I mean, not my stuff, but that's good stuff. <laughs> so uh, I got a great song uh, for it, Promises. Man, it's just so good. And, uh, and then we'll run on out of here.